Church Tech Weekly presents NAB 2014, brought to you by Church Tech Arts, your source for everything related to live production in the church. Visit our website at churchtecharts.org. Hey, well, we're continuing our NAB 2014 coverage, and we've swung by the SSL booth. SSL, of course, is known uh, far and wide for their great studio consoles, and a year ago, you guys kind of quietly released or announced the uh, the new live console here, the L500, and we're standing in front of it now, and uh, this is the first time we've seen it uh, to have it on video, so I'm here with Jason from SSL, and you're kind of the creator of this console, really, in some ways. Um, the, no, it was definitely a team effort, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, I'm lot to do with it anyway. kind of trying to, trying to guide it along and make yeah. it as good as it can be. Okay, awesome. Well, it's obviously a large format uh, console with lots of inputs and outputs. Maybe take us through some of the highlights of what makes this particular console different from other big live consoles that are on the market. Okay, um, so the live console was nearly four years in development. Um, so it's, it's a ground up design. It doesn't use any parts or any um, previous technology that we've used in any of our other um, digital consoles. Mm -hmm. So it was very much built for the live environment. It wasn't a kind of rehashed version of a another set of technologies. Um, it's a MADI based console running at 96 kilohertz. Um, we have various stage box options, um, fiber, BNC, etc. cetera. Um, all of the processing is contained inside the control surface. So it's a, a single box package. So all you need is stage boxes and the control surface. The processing engine that we use took more than three years to develop. Um, it's called the Tempest engine. One of the things that is very important about it is how efficient it is and how quickly it processes audio. So we have less than 1.4 milliseconds analog in to analog out, including all processing. Uh, it's a 64-bit floating point DSP. Um, so all of that bandwidth, all of that dynamic range is, is being used very efficiently. The other thing that's really key about the design of the live is the flexibility. And we've tried to design in flexibility into the I.O. configuration and the architecture, the DSP processing itself, and also the user interface and how the engineer interacts with the console. Um, so we have up to 976 inputs and outputs, um, physical, uh, and we can mix 192 of those at any one time. So if we want to have a look at the uh, DSP and, and how we configure that. So we've got um, 192 paths, which we can um, configure as inputs, auxiliaries, something we call a stem group, um, and master outputs. The 192 paths are split into two separate blocks. There's a 144 process paths, which have full EQ, delay, dynamics, all pass filters, etc. And then we have 48 dry paths, um, which have insert points, but no built-in processing. As we said, any of those can be configured as inputs, auxes, buses, etc. And it's very, very simple. We just tap edit using the multi-touch screen, double tap the box, and type in the number of channels that we want. Um, any of the channels can be mono, stereo, or LCR. So we can build the console that we want, that we need to use. So whether we're doing monitors, front of house, combination of both with front of house and monitors. Um, we can have up to 36 VCAs and then we've got a separate block of processing for the matrix outputs. So we can have 36 processed matrix output buses and they can be split into four separate blocks. So we can have a total of 36 matrix outputs which can be split into smaller blocks. Each of the blocks can have 32 inputs. So we can have 32 in uh, discrete inputs per block, which gives us up to 128 discrete inputs into the matrix. The routing for that can be done from anywhere within the system. So that could be inputs, mixed buses, it could be direct I.O. from stage boxes. So it's very, very flexible um, configuration. So once we've built the console that we want, we can then Again, use the touch screens to start to bring those channels that we've created onto the faders. So this particular console has got three fader tiles, as we call them. Um, each fader tile has 12 faders. And each 
tile has uh, a combination of five layers and within each layer we have five banks and each of the tiles is independent so I can have a different set of banks and layers on one tile completely different on the second and completely different on the third so if we've got three tiles fitted we can have up to 75 banks of user layers basically so again it's very flexible and we can put any channel onto any fader anywhere so if we want to work on this particular tile, this is tile number one. So we select tile number one from the drop down menu. So the bottom part of the screen shows um, the tile that we're working on. So in this case, this particular tile. The top half of the screen is all of our sources. So it's the things that we want to use, we want to drag, we want to uh, pull from there. So if we bring up um, input layers, I can bring up drums, I could bring up drums down here just using the touch screen. So if I wanted to pull down um, a bank, I just grab the bank, pull it down and drop it in. I can also take channels, drop those down in there as well. But because I can have any combination, I could for instance say, well, I also want my um, effects returns for my um, for my drum reverb, for instance, so I can take that, drop that down there. So that's now part of my, my drums layer with my effect return for my reverb, my drum reverb, and then I can delete and remove channels whenever I want. So once I've built up my layers and my banks, I can get to anything I need to, wherever I want, just by tapping the call buttons to bring that layer to the surface. So any of the tiles can be brought to the screen just by tapping the screen button. So it's not just the tile underneath the screen that we can use to interact with the, with the audio. So now we can see um, the tile underneath the screen. You can see that the, um, the channel strips are kind of in a vertical format, just like an analog console. Yep. Gain at the top, meters, uh, bus routing and then audio processing underneath. So we can tap the screen on any of the buttons. That selects that block of processing. And then these controls here that we call the quick controls, they have three assignable buttons and the encoder. And these work in conjunction with the screen as we tap through the different functions. So if I want to control um, a auxiliary send, I just tap the OGS button, select the mix bus that I want to control, and now that's on my rotary control here. And then I can switch to control the pan if it's a stereo send, for instance. So I can continue to tap on the screen just to select stuff. Um, I can also use the screen to turn things on and off. So if I unlock the screen, when I tap these routing buttons, it's just like hitting a routing button on an analog console, so I'm actually turning a mix bus send on and off when I do that. So pretty much the whole console can be controlled from these encoders, but we've also got the channel control tile, which has its own multi-touch screen, and then we have a bunch of encoders around the outside, which basically get assigned depending on which function I tap from the control tile. So I can control any part of the channel, mix buses, EQs, dynamics, everything. So if I bring up EQ, I've now got one knob and one control for each of the four EQ bands. And then I've got my high and low pass filters underneath. I can turn them on and off from here. And I can also flatten the EQ by pressing and holding the in button to flatten the EQ for me. So. This is one way we can control the audio. The quick controls are a second way. And the third way is by using the big touch screen, which is generally what most people get drawn to. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a nice big 19 inch, super bright touch screen. So we can um, have an overview of the channels that we've got selected on the tile, or we can tap the screen and then open up a detail window. So if we're looking at um, EQ, for instance, I can double tap the screen 
and now I get a detail view and now I can start doing some of the fun stuff using the multi gesture screen with pinch actions for Q obviously gain and frequency as I sweep around mm -hmm. um, and this basically can be used on any part of the channel strip so if we go to the gate and the comp we can do a similar set of things with the hold function being a pinch action so it's a very very interactive and very direct interface now just because I'm using the big touch screen it doesn't mean that I lose the quick controls underneath I can select them to track what we are selecting on the screen so that I can have fine control with the encoders as well as touch sensing from the screen and again I've also always got the channel control tile as well mm -hmm. and all three of those interfaces basically work together so that um, we can choose which way we want to mix on the console right. it's entirely up to the engineer how they feel comfortable and how they want to do things um, processing wise we've got um, some unique SSL features so obviously we can color the channels so we can put user colors in Another thing that we have is something we call Iconics, mm -hmm. which basically allows us not only to um, assign a name and a color, but also a pictogram. Mm -hmm. So we can assign a picture to that particular channel to give us a much more fast access uh, and understanding of what that channel is. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting that your brain is programmed to recognize shapes much more quickly than it right. is to read text. Right. And although it looks like a bit of a gimmick, Actually, it's quite surprising how quickly you become to, you start to rely on those iconic images. Yeah. I like the buffalo uh, icon there. My personal favorite's the meerkat. Yeah, oh yeah, you gotta love the meerkat. You gotta yeah. love the meerkat. Yeah. So um, we've already looked at EQ, but um, here we've got all of the classic SSL EQ functionality. So we've got a selection of filter types that we can choose from. So it's very easy to emulate E-series, G-series um, EQs. Um, on the mid-bands, we can also select from a couple of different types of parametric and also from an, uh, have a notch filter as well, which is uh, very useful. In a similar vein, the Dynamics processing has a number of options. Um, we have um, separate sidechain filters for the gate and the compressor, but we can also have the compressor in peak and RMS modes. And on every compressor, there's also a tube emulation mode as well. So we've been building in a lot of flexibility again in, in, and a lot of choice and, and in the toolbox for the processing. Um, another unique feature on the console is the all-pass filter. So we have an all-pass filter on every process channel. Um, it's difficult to know how familiar everybody is with all-pass filters, to be honest. Yeah. But um, basically, an all-pass filter um, allows us to, um, to tilt phase according to frequency. It's something that a lot of people see uh, in loudspeaker processors mm -hmm. to help align multiple loudspeaker drivers. Yeah. Um, it's a, also a very useful tool when you're mixing audio. It's particularly useful where you've got multiple microphones on a single instrument. So things like snare top, snare bottom, kick in, kick out, bass guitar, bass, uh, bass mic and bass amp, um, or bass DI, sorry, um, acoustic piano where you've got multiple microphones picking up the piano. Um, trying to um, use EQ to fix problems like feedback or comb filtering, because they're time-based problems, EQ is not the solution, basically. It'll mask the problem, but it can't solve it. The, uh, some people would try, for instance, using delay, channel delay, to compensate for, say, a bass DI and bass mic signal. And again, it works to a limited degree, but because the, um, uh, the comb filtering is wavelength specific, if we delay the whole channel, all we're doing is moving the interaction of the frequencies around. The all-pass filter allows us to focus in directly like a scalpel onto the frequencies that we need to change in time so that we can line up those two microphone signals much more accurately.
probably the last thing that we're going to want to look at is the effects rack, very important part of the console. Again, it uses a lot of the um, SSL history, a lot of the SSL legacy. So we've got all the classic things like the SSL bus compressor, um, all of the dynamics processing, so all the gates and EQs, etc. Um, we've got more than 40 effects for you to choose from. We've got 96 effects slots that you can put them into. So again, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of choice. Um, we've also got the auto mix um, function that we've had on the C-Series broadcast consoles for many years. Um, again, this was a licensed version of the Dugan um, auto mixer. We can have as many instances of that as we can fit in. So if you wanted to, you could probably put one on every channel on the console <laughs> if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but we've got all the traditional stuff, graphic EQs, parametric EQs, delays, reverbs, pretty much everything there in the toolbox that you would need on a day-to-day -day basis. But the key thing about the effects rack um, is again part of the Tempest processing engine that we've developed. Every one of these effects, except for obviously the time-based effects like delays, reverbs, etc., but all of the inline effects are basically processed in one sample. So at 96 kilohertz, that is a very, very small amount of time. So adding effects into your inserts adds you know, very, very minimal amounts of time, and they're all being processed 64-bit floating point. So obviously a very, uh, very comprehensive, very large format console, tons of processing power, lots of I.O., uh, lots of stuff going on. It is shipping. It's been shipping for about seven months now, you said. Yep. And um, you have uh, some great videos on the website uh, that people can go look at. Yep. Uh, the offline software is going to be going live soon as well, so people can try out and uh, have a look around a bit more in depth from their, from their laptop. Um, the YouTube channel is also live, so just go to solidstatelogic.com and see what you think. All right, well, very good, uh, very great overview of this, and obviously a, uh, a big splash of an entry into the live format, uh, large format live mixing console here, and it's a great interface. I've had it at uh, my church for the last couple of weeks. I've been playing around with it, and it is really fun to mix on, very powerful, and it sounds great, just as we would expect from an SSL. So great job on this, and we're looking forward to seeing future updates. All right, thanks. Thank you.